Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Kind of a chilly morning in the desert here a few days after um, New Year's Day. Um, I feel like the crush is over. <laughs> But not the crush for growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible lays that upon us. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here this morning. The grace of Jesus to be more Christ-like. To be more forgiving. To be more patient. To be more faith-filled. To be more worshipful. To be more hopeful. To be harder workers. To harder, be harder workers. And the knowledge of Jesus is to know to know more about him. Who is this baby in the manger? Is he really God? What can he do for us? Are there other gods out there, other saviors? Is this just another savior or is this the savior? The answer is this is just the savior. And Epiphany, Epiphany marks the unwrapping of Jesus. Epiphany as the season right after Christmas, which has the image of unwrapping a gift. If I gave the kids or you a gift, uh, they would be unwrapped. The kids would get right into it, right? Except my sister. She makes an art of unwrapping a present. It takes forever. But that's not the point. We unwrap the baby Jesus. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the unwrapping. Next week already, I don't think I'm mistaken, is the baptism, is the baptism of Jesus. So we unwrap another layer of Jesus when he goes to the waters of the Jordan and uh, the, the layer, the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. The voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. The unwrapping today of Jesus has to do with um, someone who journeyed, journeyed to see Jesus. So it, wasn't a, it wasn't shepherds from just outside the town limits who trotted into town on the night of Jesus' birth and went to the manger and saw the newborn. These folks came from a long Long way. Speaking of long ways, it was 1950, 1954 when the French left Southeast Asia, which left a power vacuum in this third world area of the world. In the 1950s, you might recall, that was before my time, you know, so I just read this. You recall there was a, a power struggle between the communist Soviets and the United States in the 19. In the 1950s, the Cold War was starting, and the Cold War uh, heating up. Get the paradox? Cold War heating up. And the nuclear threat was uh, uh, always hanging over the heads of uh, world leaders. And to fill this um, power vacuum, the Soviets sent on trips to Southeast Asia some of their people, some of their diplomats. And the United States did the same thing. These guys took long trips to Southeast Asia to, to get established, build influence. Now, when the Soviets got off of the planes, their people there, their diplomats, they did what? They learned the language. They learned the language. They observed and followed the customs and the traditions of the country. They became very polished diplomats. And according to a book whose title I will share with you in a few moments, um, the ambassador of the United States flew this long trip across the world and he parked himself immediately in the embassy there and he didn't come out. And he spent all of his time inside the embassy. He didn't learn the language. He didn't go out and observe the people. He didn't learn the traditions, like things like that, nor did he follow them. He had parties and he had big receptions. And other diplomats and people who came, senators from the United States, he had lavish parties for them. And they talked big talk, but they never learned the people and their needs. The communist diplomats not only learned those skills, but they started doing practical things like building water pumps for the people of Southeast Asia. The United States never did that. They were too busy and snide, side hob, hobnobbing, hobnobbing around. So these two trips from these trips from two different sources of people from two different countries came, and one trip changed the people and the other trip didn't. 
So a book was written in 1958. The book was called The Ugly American. It's still in print. It's very, very popular. And one little detail I remember, I read the book. It was my time. I take that back. I read that book. I read the book. Is the American ambassador got back on the uh, airplane, went back to Washington. He was going to make a report. And he was going to, he was going to tell about how we need to change. And he got on the plane. He didn't start writing. And he got back to the states, and he never wrote it. The ugly, the ugly American. Even though he didn't take the trip, there was a young man who read the book, and he changed. He was moved by this trip of others. In fact, he and five of his colleagues took out an ad in uh, probably the New York Times, it was a, a major uh, paper of New York City, and they took out an ad and said, we re recommend everybody read this book, The Ugly American, and they bought 100 copies, and they gave them to their colleagues in the U.S. Senate, and the man's name was John Kennedy. And even though he didn't literally make the trip, he took the trip through the book, and the trip changed him. And you know where the Peace Corps was inspired from? Where the Peace Corps was inspired? From this experience about not being around the people, not helping the people, not being arrogant and above it all, but being humble and servant-like. And John Kennedy, when he became President of the United States, from this book, which records the trip, he started, but many other themes. A trip was taken by the wise men, which is our text for today, Matthew chapter 2, I believe, verses 1 through 12. They took a trip, and they had in mind something to take this trip. They had in mind, they were convinced that there was a monarch. More than a monarch, the king of the Jews, king of the Jews, Maybe it wasn't Mona Mark, but they knew it was a king. And this king was worthy of obeisance and a courtesy visit hmm? and worship. We know it was worship, which, which tells you that the wise men were going to see God himself. Because you don't usually worship Sometimes I think we do our kids. That's a footnote. We adore our kids. Now, I know you love your grandkids. And when I get mine someday, I'll have to be careful to love them to pieces, but not to worship them, not to God. And the wise men knew this, so they wanted to worship this newborn king, the king of the Jews. And they were given a star which gave them direction. And they were, they were resolved to, to make this trip. And they got, they got mm, hung up a little bit in Jerusalem. They thought a monarch would be born in the capital city of the Jews, Jerusalem. And you know the story how it goes. They were redirected to Bethlehem. They were redirected to Bethlehem. And when they got to Bethlehem, they went into the house, and they saw the child and his mother. And what did they do? They said they fell down. They fell down. Now, I thought about illustrating that, but I'm not going to do it. But think of me as falling down. And I don't just mean on my knees, which is a nice symbol of humility and obeisance. But as they fell on their faces. I mean, they were serious about worship. So they fell on their faces, the goal of their trip, and they worshipped source, which deserves worship. And it ain't our kids. I know you love your kids to pieces and your grandkids. I do mine too, but that's reserved for God. And they worshiped him on this trip. And it's interesting because the text leads you to believe that part of worship is giving something. Is giving something. When you're invited to a house party or you stay at a friend's home, where's home? California? Anybody here from outside of California? Huh? Arizona? Iowa. That's a foreign country. Okay. When Therese goes back to Iowa and she stays with mom and dad or friends like that, and they put her up for a week, she says thank you. She says she gives them a gift because she's very, she's very appreciative. So the wise men, they got to see God and they worshiped him. And they gave lavish, expensive gifts. I call it investment. I call it investment. And Therese invest with a thank you gift 
to her, to her host and hostesses and investment. That's part of worship. Now, here's the real part in the story about the ugly American, and that is trips often change people. Change people. Don't you find that true? Happens to me all the time. I go to Hawaii. I've been to Hawaii. And when I go there, my wife knows this. She laments this. And I go, wouldn't it be great to live here? Let's sell everything in buy a house. And she says, you're crazy. But I'm changed. I'm changed, okay? Or we'll go, I don't know, anywhere. And I might pick up a new hobby. You know, I might pick up a new hobby because I was introduced to it. Or new food. A new food. I said, let's quit fixing mashed potatoes and gravy. Let's eat sushi. <laughs> and that didn't go over well. But it in the little story I had about the ugly Americans, sometimes people aren't changed. They resist it. But the wise men were changed. <clears throat> they persevered in their trip. They fell on their faces and they worshipped Jesus, the monarch from heaven, hmm? savior from sin. They gave him expensive gifts. They invested him. And what happened? They could hear the voice of God. Hmm? And it says that. I won't look it up, but then it says, and being warned in a dream, they were told to go home another way. You've taken a trip this morning. You got in your vehicle. Some of you walked. I walked. Where's John? John always beats me here. John, where are you? John walks, but you've taken a trip. And you've come here to worship, I hope. I hope that's right there at the top. And I know some of you came to light the candles and to read and to put the hymnals on the board and to put the coffee cake out and to see your friends. But I hope you came resolved to fall on your faces and worship God and worship God and invest in him. And when that happens, there's a change and that's you start hearing the voice of God. The voice of God. And hearing the voice of God is God's intent on putting you in life where you need to be. I fight that sometimes. I hear the voice of God. And I don't like, I, don't, I said, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my way. I want to do this and that. The voice of God says to me, spend more time with your family. Oh, I'm too busy for that. But that's the voice of God. That's the voice of God. And the wise men give us a lesson because they obey the voice of God. The voice of God says, don't go home via Jerusalem and Herod. Go home a different way. And so then they, having heard the voice of God, they adjust. let's stop there. Every time you make a trip to this location to worship, and to sacrifice, you'll hear the voice of God. Might be just one little sentence. And what Sid hears is for Sid, and what Jane hears is for Jane, and what the kids hear in the children's sermon is for them. You don't have to compare notes because God is customizing his voice to each one of you, and he's saying, I want you in the place where I want you hmm, in your life, and ultimately so you're ready for eternal life. You'll hear the voice, but then will we comply? Will we adjust? The wise men did. And it's an adjustment for your good. Because God wants you at a certain spot. It might be in a wheelchair. It might be at home. It might be globe-trotting, I don't know, or somewhere in between. But that's exactly where God wants you in your life and setting you up for eternal life. The adjustment's the hard part. Well, maybe it's making the trips the hard part. But you made it this morning. You made it this morning. And there's the voice of God. Are you listening? Might be an adjustment. An internal one. An internal one. You know, don't be so hard on people, right? 
Why don't you forgive that, that offense? Why are you so stingy, the Lord says. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Where is your faith? Could be anything, but it's there. Worship, listen, adjust. What a great God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart in Christ Jesus into life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>